Hello, and a very, very warm, seriously, it feels like a sauna in here. Welcome back to the studio. Today's video is a collaboration with a number of other artists. I'll leave all of their details down below, so after you finish watching this video, don't forget to go check theirs out. This video and collaboration explores the topic of environmental pollution. This choice of topic was dreamt up by Lana of Lana Goes Art. I'll link her channel up above. In today's video, I am painting and discussing the Carner Blue Butterfly. It's Plebegis melissa samuelis. This is a species threatened throughout its range and extirpated in a large portion of its range by human activity. In my contribution to this collaboration, I'll be exploring a somewhat broader definition of pollution and all of the different ways in which human activity can impact life forms around us. If you're new here, hi, my name is Lee Angold. I'm a botanical and natural science illustrator based in Kitchener, Waterloo, Canada. Here on YouTube, I share watercolor techniques and tips and some insights into my daily life as an illustrator. If this is content that you're interested in, don't forget to hit like and subscribe. Also, if you'd like to get to know me a little bit better, I've left all of my links down below. You can also support me on Patreon, where I offer some really cool rewards, including some behind the scenes looks and one-on-one -on -one coaching. I can't wait to see you there. The Carner Blue Butterfly is native to the Great Lakes area. Its range used to extend up into Canada on the other side of the Great Lakes, so notably in the Great Lakes region of Ontario, where I live. Unfortunately, as of the year 2000, the Carner Blue Butterfly has been declared extirpated in Canada, so it no longer lives in Ontario. The Carner Blue Butterfly is now also threatened throughout the rest of its range and has been extirpated from a number of other areas that it used to live in as well. Today's painting is actually preparation for a much larger piece, which is about two years in the making. Since uh, my interest in botanical art interacted with my newfound interest in gardening, in researching beneficial plants um, and pollinator species to put into my garden uh, to complement my food crops, I discovered the perennial lupin or sundial lupin, which is the sole larval host of the Carner blue butterfly and essential to the efforts to reintroduce the Carner blue butterfly. I've run into some challenges along the way in sourcing, planting, growing out, and referencing sundial lupins for that botanical art piece, which is some of what I will discuss in today's video. I've long been fascinated by the interaction between humans and our surrounding environment. I find that we often treat ourselves as exterior from nature and so we'll go out into a natural area rather than considering ourselves as part of a whole system. So exploring this thought a little bit further, it's not just the waste that we drop on the ground. Every single choice we make throughout our lives impacts the natural world that we are a part of. It's not just the litter, the items that we throw out or litter the ground with, but also the homes we live in are part of our surrounding environment. So when we pave over and build a house that is disrupting a local ecosystem, our entire food system, the food we eat and how we bring it to ourselves, all of that every step of the way impacts a whole range of different species, both in our local ecosystem and anywhere where we bring food from. And even beyond that, agriculture and transportation creates pollution in the form of greenhouse gases, which affect climate change and then have knock-on effects on other ecosystems which are not correct, connected directly to where we live or where we're getting food from. 
So circling back to the Carner Blue Butterfly, when I first discovered the Carner Blue Butterfly, I was led to believe that the main uh, threat to the Carner Blue Butterfly was the loss of specifically sundial lupins. Now traditionally, now lupins are actually a very common garden plant. However, many of the lupins that you would buy at, for example, a garden center are not a native species to this specific area. They are hybrids or selections of plants that are chosen specifically for desirable traits. And when I say desirable traits, I do not mean desirable traits to a Carner Blue Butterfly. I do mean desirable traits to humans. So that would be a very large flowering habit, perhaps some interesting colors, etc. In addition to displacing what could, the space that could be taken up by a native sundial lupin, these garden center lupins also then hybridize very easily with surrounding perennial lupins um, to create then hybrid species. And there's been a concern that part of what has led to the decline of the Carner Blue Butterfly is that they do not recognize these other lupins. They will not lay their eggs there. Certainly, if you speak to native plant enthusiasts or native plant companies, they will encourage you to plant only the native sundial lupin for the purposes of reintroducing the Carner Blue Butterfly. So that's where the story of this piece begins. My plan was, and is eventually, to paint a sundial lupin and the animal that it plays sole host to the Carner Blue Butterfly. And through this to address some of the fragile interdependent relationships that humans can unknowingly disrupt in our environment. To this end, at the beginning of last year, I got myself some references um, to plant in my garden to grow out as the botanical reference. So I sourced from a reputable native plant nursery for sundial lupin seedlings um, and planted them out in my uh, perennial pollinator patch. They grew out through most of last summer and then at the end of the summer I was contacted actually by the native plant company who apologized profusely and refunded my purchase informing me that in their seed sourcing they had mistakenly gotten seeds which may have been hybridized um, with other lupins and thus might not be suitable for Carner Blue reintroduction purposes. So um, given my original goal in buying these plants, I of course went through them and, I de and checked each of my plants out of the four. Three of them did show some fairly obvious signs of being not pure sundial lupin, so I pulled those up and I tossed them, intending to get replacements this year. And the last one actually did seem like it matched all of the looks of a perennial sundial lupin at the time, so I left it be. And this year, the plant came up just absolutely gorgeous and beautiful and vibrant and blooming and obviously not pure sundial lupin. So the way I could tell, um, there's, a, a, there's a number of tells here, but the way that I could tell is actually the number of leaflets on each of these leaves. Uh, so a sundial lupin will have between seven and 11 leaflets on mature leaves. Um, this one has a lot more. For example, counting the leaflets here, you can see there are 15. So that was a bit of a bummer, and obviously I can't use this as a reference for painting a sundial 
lupin and my other lupins that I got this year are significantly smaller. However, the other thing I noticed was that this lupin, despite being a hybrid, has just been buzzing with pollinators. And so it struck me that it would be a real shame to pull this up. So before I just immediately pulled this up, I wanted to check in and do a little bit more research. And I want to bring you down this rabbit hole with me. So then I tried to research the Carner Blue Butterfly, but not from the perspective of the native plant enthusiasts. And what I found out was very interesting. People who research the Carner Blue Butterfly have, in fact, been able to raise Carner Blue Butterflies on non-native lupins. So while the Carner Blue Butterfly does, in its natural environment, depend purely on the sundial lupin, that is more, it seems, a happenstance. This is the only lupin that exists in this area. So it is the sole larval host for the Carter Blue Butterfly in nature. However, it is not the only species that can support a Carter Blue Butterfly. So why then, when lupins are in fact widespread um, in gardens around the area, why have Carner blue butterflies been extirpated? Well, it seems like it's a more broad habitat loss problem. Carner blue butterflies live in fairly large populations and they depend on a specific formation of lupins. Not just the presence of one lupin here or there in a decorative garden. Carner blue butterflies live in oak savannas this is a specific ecosystem with often oak trees spread very, very far apart um, that ha cast a very broad dappled shade over a meadow structure where you'll have big fields of lupins in this case locally. Those would be sundial lupins. And in this environment, the Carner blue butterflies have two full life cycles every year, but that long life cycle then depends on having a very large field of lupins blooming over a very long time. So yes, in this area, which is the only area <laughs> that the Carner Blue Butterfly is native to, the only native lupin species is the sundial lupin, so it is its only larval host. Obviously, that would be the preferred species to use. However, the more immediate cause of the decline of the Carner blue butterfly is not the loss of a specific lupin species, but rather the loss of its whole habitat. And that is also due to human pollution. In that case though, when we talk about pollution, we're not talking about an item that we leave out in an environment. We're deleting whole environments and replacing, <laughs> we are polluting environments with ourselves, with our own habitations and with our agricultural land. So at this point, you might be wondering, what does this all mean to you? What does this mean to me? What does this mean for my art, for my garden? And what does this mean in terms of our broader impact? How can we address this kind of environmental pollution? Those are all fantastic questions. I'll answer some as best I can. From the point of view of my garden, that beautiful big lupin that's actually a hybrid, well, I'm keeping it for now. On the whole, I think that it's much better for me to have live plants here than the concrete that was here before, or even just plain grass like most of my neighbors. More broadly though, what this reinforces to me is both the 
complicated, interconnected way in which we interact with our surrounding environment, that we really, really are an integral part of the environment around us, and that we can't separate humans from the rest of the environment and talk about pollution as though we're throwing something into another environment, but rather think of ourselves as part of a system. It also really reinforces to me that depending on individuals to make complicated decisions about how to minimize our impact is bound to fail because you'll end up with well-meaning people stuck on whether to pull up a flower to save a butterfly. This is the kind of research that we can't just leave to individuals to try to figure out on our own. We really need better leadership on a global scale on a government scale. We need to be accountable for our waste, not in an individual action way. So let me know your thoughts down below. What are you doing to improve your local environment and mitigate your impact? I can tell you one thing for sure. I was not for seeing how much this simple project of painting a butterfly was going to make me consider and question my whole role in the world and all of the small decisions that I make every single day. So I'm really curious to hear your thoughts and advice. As always, don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. And since this is a collaboration, go into the description for this video and check out all the other videos in this collab. Thank you so much. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.